Please stand if you are able and <clears throat> for today's scripture reading, which comes from John 20, verses 1 through 18. I think many of you will recognize this. Early on the first <clears throat> day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw the stone had been, uh, had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples sent out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Um, he saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in and, and <clears throat> he saw and he believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over <clears throat> to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had <clears throat> said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Why, whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Yes, you can be seated. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. We come in on this Easter morning taking a breath of the last six weeks that we have had. These last six weeks where we have emptied ourselves, where we have called out to God in our longing, seeking God's presence and provision. And so over the last six weeks, um, during our Lenten season, we were in the midst of a series called Good Enough, where we were reminded that no matter what heartache we've experienced, no matter what we've gone through, we are good enough for God. And so part of that journey, um, some of us read a companion guide by Kate Bowler um, called Good Enough. And this morning, this, the, this devotional that she shares on Easter Sunday starts out like this. I'm going to read just the beginning of her devotional from today. It says, a proud British gardener named Steve Owen specializes in prize-winning breeds of snowdrops. It says he pulled a pot from the shelf, white petals dangling downward as if it were about to drip from the delicate green stalk. Beaming, he described this was the first time that the plant had ever bloomed. After 14 years of tending it, most of the time it was just a fight to keep it alive. Alleluia, he said joyously. Gardening requires a certain kind of hope, envisioning a new life in the midst of despair and death. For those of you who are gardeners, I don't know this, but... For those of you who are gardeners who toil and trowel, who pluck and prune all for a single bloom, the very act of gardening is one of hope. And this is the exact kind of hope that a woman who was hunting on the first Easter morning found herself in. 
The sun had yet to peek over the horizon. The greenish haze of the moon offers barely enough light to move about. And according to John's gospel, Mary Magdalene is awake. Grief does that to you. Day stretches into night, the moon chases the sun into the day, and this rhythm cannot win against the restlessness of an unsettled mind and a broken heart. As we come into our Easter morning scripture that Bruce just read for us, I try to imagine how the disciples and how Jesus' followers must have been feeling on that Easter morning. Mary had been with Jesus all along the way. She had seen lives made new. She'd seen bodies healed. She'd seen eyes opened. She'd heard that the, the complaining that the disciples had done, right? If you read the Gospels, the disciples like to complain a lot. She'd heard all that grumbling. She had heard the Pharisees and the religious leaders shame him. She saw how the crowds adored him in one moment and hated him in the next. She saw as they took Jesus before Pilate. She saw as they crucified her Lord. And so now that it was all over, now that it was done, now that Jesus was in the tomb, Mary thought she might get a chance for a breath. And so she went to the tomb to grieve, like many of us do, right? We go to be with our loved one, even though they are not there, present before us. We know that their body is there, that some piece of them is left on earth. And so we go and we sit and we take flowers, right? Or maybe a bottle of wine or a balloon or whatever it might be and sit before the grave just for a moment of peace. And her heart was heavy, I'm sure, and it was still dark. And yet, when Mary looked in, what did she find? Nothing. There was no body. And the linens that had been wrapped around Jesus, it says, were rolled up and were lying there. It was still dark. The tomb was empty. I imagine this is the kind of grief um, people feel all the time. Whether you're a sports team who has been playing all year long, gearing up for the big day, and you lose in the playoffs, right? Royals fans know that loss all too well. So do Chiefs fans this year, right? Or I imagine political campaign parties as they're gearing up for a big election. Somebody's got to lose, right? And so they pack up all their signs, and they go home. And we ask ourselves, what do we do now? We've just spent the last however many months or years of our lives trying to figure all this stuff out, trying to accomplish the big goal. And then you're lost. We all have days like that when things stand in front of our dreams, when our hope is dashed, when our children go astray, when we get a write-up at a job, when a test result comes back positive. And we ask ourselves, why me, Lord? Why me? I go to church every week. I teach a Sunday school class. I serve on the board. My life is going so well, and now there is darkness before us. Our text today starts with agony. Jesus has died. And Mary goes to the tomb first, and she sees something that shakes her to her core. The stone is gone, it's rolled away, and the body is gone. Now for us, we shout out, right? The stone is rolled away, the tomb is empty. We get excited about that, right? We sing hallelujah when we say that. But 2,000 years ago when Mary stood at that tomb and she said the stone is rolled away, the tomb is empty, for her that was not good news. For her that was the worst possible news. Because everything that she had been going through for the past three years, she'd witnessed the death of her Savior on a cross 
and she comes to find that his body is gone. It was in Jewish tradition that you would have a seven-day mourning period, right? And not even the grave robbers would dare to take the body because they knew how important that time was. And so when Mary came and she saw that the body was gone, she was distraught. So the text tells us that she runs. She runs first to Simon Peter and to the disciple whom Jesus loved, John says. And she tells them what has happened. She says, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they laid him. So the guys come to check it out, right? They never believe her first. They got to come look and see for themselves. No, no one gets that joke, okay. <laughs> so they, they come and they look in the tomb and it says Simon Peter looks in and he sees that, she's, that, that Jesus is gone and then the disciple whom Jesus loved look, looks and sees that he is gone. And the text says they see and they believe. Now, I don't know exactly what they believe because the scripture goes on to say they don't understand the scriptures that he was to rise from the dead. So I don't know it's they believe Mary now or or what, but they go back. There's no hallelujahs. There's no excitement. There's no understanding. They go. But Mary waits. It says Mary sits outside of the tomb And she cries. And she peers inside that tomb again. But this time, it's not empty, right? It says there's two angels that have appeared. One at the head and one at the feet of where Jesus' body would have been. And they say to her, why are you crying? And she stutters over her words and says, they've taken him. And so she turns to leave. And suddenly she runs into someone who she thinks is a gardener. And she says, tell me where they have taken him. Surely you know, good gardener. It's a strange detail. John's really the only one that does this, right? She turns and she sees Jesus, but she doesn't know it's Jesus. Instead, she thinks it's the gardener. And I wonder, why does she think it's the gardener? Is it because, like, Jesus has unwrapped himself and he's naked, so he needs some clothes, so he goes and he steals the gardener's jumpsuit? Like, why does she think this is a gardener? In the, the, the devotional that Kate Bowler writes, she says, maybe she thinks, or it's a it's Jesus is a gardener because Jesus was crucified in a garden a tiny beautiful detail that reminds us that death is never too far away from new life maybe she thinks Jesus is a gardener because Jesus looks like his dad the first gardener who tended eden maybe Jesus looks like adam the head gardener for the new eden of the new heavens and the new earth Maybe it's because he carries pruning shears of a vine dresser and carefully tender of our souls, ready to pluck and plant and uproot and cut back. Maybe because this gardener, this Jesus, looks like he's ready to cultivate new life to pull us toward resurrection. Or maybe it looks like this gardener knows something about hope. Hope that Mary desperately needs. Over the past couple months, um, Emmy has started to become very inquisitive, as Erin would say, um, about where babies come from. Uh, She's been asking me a whole lot of questions, and so we try to give her honest yet age-appropriate answers. We're probably failing in the parent department. (laughs) But as I've been thinking about the the process of a a baby, because I've had to explain this to my five-year-old, I'm amazed at the fact that this small microscopic egg that is fertilized, that you, can, that you can't even see before the naked eye, contains all of the parts of a full-fledged human that grows and grows and grows. And just that small little egg 
somehow contains ears and hair and lungs and joy and fear and sorrow, that it contains all the parts of a person. And I imagine the same is true for a seed, right? Have you ever planted a seed? What comes later looks nothing like what is put in the ground. That small seed contains all the parts necessary to grow into a beautiful flower or a juicy tomato or a luscious watermelon or whatever it is you like. I don't know why I picked tomatoes and watermelons. I don't like tomatoes or watermelons. But to get from that to this, to get from the seed to the plant, it takes a lot of work like that gardener that we told at the beginning, right? But it also takes hope. Sometimes I think it's easy for us to just tell this Easter story and say, Christ is risen and go home. But I often think, like, why does it matter? Like, it's on the liturgical calendar. There's Easter dresses in Target. So I have to get dressed up and go. Jake gets the, you know, the the music that comes in about nine months ago so he can start preparing for Easter. We get emails that say, hey, order your Easter lilies now. So it's like we have to do it, right? It's here. But does this story matter? You know, death and violence and hatred, all these things still seem to exist. And it's hard to believe That God would send God's self in human form to heal brokenness and not finish it. But I think at the very core of this story, why it matters that we tell it year after year, Sunday after Sunday, is because what's rooted in this story is even though death and destruction and fear and hate all still exist, there's still a seed in the midst of that, a seed of hope. In 2018, the Dallas Dallas News published an article, and the lead started this way. It said, the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, uh, recently released a startling new statistic on the rise of deaths by suicide in the U.S. It was up 25% from 1999 across most ethnic groups and ages. These numbers clearly point to a crisis but what kind? And so the author of this text is an opinion writer, uh, but he's also a behavioral scientist. And he says this, he says, as a behavioral scientist who studies basic psychological needs, including the need need for meaning, I am convinced that our nation's suicide crisis is a part of a crisis of meaninglessness. I wonder if Mary and the rest of the disciples felt like the last three years had been meaningless. What's the point? Jesus died. Everything they imagined, everything that they'd hoped for, that they'd longed for, was nailed to a cross and crucified, and then when the body was put in a tomb, it disappeared. What's the point? Hate is still here. Fear is still here. Why does it even matter anymore? And I think Jesus coming as a gardener, the good gardener, or mistaken for a gardener, is a reminder of hope. A reminder that death is not the end of the story. That the worst thing that could possibly happen to us doesn't end with a period. Because there is something next. There is something new. And if we cultivate that seed, even if it takes 14 years or 20 years or 50 years or 100 years or 2,000 years, hope is still there. Hope is what lets us grow. And Jesus is that gardener for us, standing at the entrance of a tomb, reaching out to us, saying, I am here, and I'm going to be with God, your God. 
This morning, um, I got a couple ushers that have um, something for each of you. Um, inside the little bag, there is either a heart or a butterfly, I think. Is that what's in there? Hearts and butterflies? Okay, make sure I got the right shape. Uh, but those are called seed paper. And so inside the, the heart or the butterfly um, in the paper is, is seeds of wildflowers. And so each of you get one, and I want to invite you this week to or whenever it starts to warm up a little bit. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know anything about planting season, so ask Chris. Um, I want you to take those, and you're going to bury them. And then eventually, the seeds will sprout, and new life will form. These are a reminder for us that to get new life, to get things to grow, things have to be buried first. So on this Easter morning, as we stand before the empty tomb, we can come with sorrow and we can come with joy all at the same time, but also come with hope, knowing that God is here, that Christ is alive, Christ is risen. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Let's pray. Oh God, I give you thanks for this time to gather together with one another to experience the joy of Easter. God, on this Easter morning, we proclaim Christ is risen, and we shout out from our lungs, Alleluia, as loud as we can. But God, we also know that we come in the midst of fear and sorrow and grief. God, whatever tomb we stand before, we know that you are here, you are with us, and you are alive. God, continue to show us the hope that comes with the story of Easter. We pray this in your heavenly name. Amen.